That's right, everybody. As always, thank you so much for tuning in and making this your podcast or your live stream of choice. I'm your host, John Greenwald Jr., founder and creator of TheBlackVault.com, and I am doing a segment today that although some of you may be sick and tired of hearing about the Wilson Davis documents, there is so many avenues to research with this. And what people constantly tell me is, is it deserves the attention. This is my, I would say what I'm calling anyway, the final act. Kind of the, should I say nail in the coffin? Because I know one person who doesn't want me to use that phrase. Uh, but in my opinion, the nail that you're starting to see the nails in the coffin, that I believe that we're starting to lean very much more to fantasy versus fact. And I'm putting that up front simply for this. If you guys are sick of hearing me talking about it because you believe that it's real, you may not like this video, but I do encourage you to do two things. Listen to it and challenge what you believe because this video is a result of me doing that. But also listen to my interview with Jay from Project Unity. And I wanna also say up front, I am so glad that I did that interview with Jay. Uh, he is intelligent. He's young, he's passionate, and he's not going anywhere, which I, which I encourage him not to. Uh, in essence, he has a thirst for the truth. And I have no, no, no regrets bringing him onto the show and having a near three-hour conversation uh, with the man. And, and this, even though I may go against what he had brought forward in the show, I encourage you to, to watch that and see from his vantage point, who is advocating that they are real, see that evidence or the admittedly the lack thereof, and see if you, again, support or refute that claim. This video is a culmination of not only what I learned from my interview with Jay, but after I got off uh, the interview with Jay, kept to my word and looked into some of the stuff that I was not aware of. Number one, the Discovery Channel interview that was was referenced uh, a couple other things that had been brought up uh, but specifically a nro document that seemingly is the root of the entire story and i'll get into that but in, in essence and let me uh, go ahead and pull up the vis visuals this is often referred to as stephen greer's nro document and i truly believe now that i realize what document it was because admittedly, I had told Jay uh, I wasn't sure which it was, which was true. I had found what actually was the real document. I just thought, you know what? There's absolutely no way that Dr. Stephen Greer would try and pass this off as legitimate. So I entered the interview with Jay thinking, I've got it wrong. Maybe the document's not even you know out there and it was only referenced, but it was classified. So Greer withheld it, but only talked about it that he showed it to Admiral Wilson. Well, I had it correct. And that's and, and I'm partially glad I didn't know that with Jay because I would have derailed the interview, uh, but not by choice or maliciously, but rather that document can be destroyed using logic and uh, known facts about documents. And, and I will, again, go through that and, and prove it, that that document is a hoax. But it is often cited in the most, what are often termed as the most legitimate and credible sources for fighting that these documents, the Wilson Davis documents, are real. That includes UFO Joe's blog, which he calls a mega blog. There's like four parts to it. it I've, I, it's got to be like 75,000 plus words, I think he said, but it's gigantic. It's in there. And Richard Dolan, uh, who calls this the leak of the century. They all fall back on Stephen's, Stephen Greer's narrative that this NRO document was what was shown to Admiral Wilson. According to Greer, and I'll get into the exact quote so you know that I am not uh, paraphrasing or, or taking people out of context, I'll get into exactly what Stephen Greer says about it, but I first wanted to show you the unedited document in the sense that this is what Stephen Greer put out there and published. Obviously edited that there's some uh, redactions here, here, and here, a handwritten note from Greer up here, but essentially this is what Greer 
has passed around. I'm not going to read the entire document, uh, but it, it, in essence, it was talking about a security uh, concern and it was sent to all of these uh, locations which is problematic in itself. But you'll see why Stephen Greer believes that it's less about the content of the message, but more about what we see over here. Here is page three of the same document. So that was it. It was a three page memo. Okay. So we're going to dissect the major problems with it. But I want you to first read and hear what Stephen Greer says the document is and why it's important. This was uh, published back in at least 2019. This was the earliest, uh, I guess, version you, you can say of this particular page here, which was an email. You see this constant contact that Greer's organization sent out. Well, Wayback Machine, which I often look at because it gives you timestamps, irrefutable timestamps of when this information was out. This is what Greer had sent out, and again, at least July of 2019, if not earlier. It's the National Reconnaissance Office document. The reason it's important is not so much for, his co for its content. Take note of the distribution list, please. Blue Fire, which is a code name, 1991, Commander's Net, Royal Ops, Cosmic Ops, so Cosmic Clearance. You've heard of this, it's not a myth. It's real. Madge Ops, Magi, it's Magic Ops. It goes through a whole bunch of them. Nellis Division, all these code names, uh, code numbers, and you get down to some really interesting things. MOC is Military Operating Center, and MOA is Military Operating Area. SOG is the Special Operations Team, but you get into Red Flag, Dark East, Dark South, Paput Mesa, Sally Carter, Groom Lake, Dreamland, Blackjack Team, Blackjack Control, is the Edwards Complex in California, Roulette Team, Aquatech, Sea Spray, and others. This secret document went to the Admiral, Admiral Thomas Wilson, prior to our meeting, and he actually recognized one of these entities and made an inquiry. It was being run by a contractor, and the contractor, one of these corporate contractors, when he called them up, he says, I'm Admiral Tom Wilson. At that time, he was head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I want to be read into this project. Guess what happened? They said, sir, you don't have a need to know. This is the guy who, who's supposed to give the intelligence briefings for the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the United States. He was told, you don't have a need to know. And Admiral Wilson said, God damn it, if I don't have a need to know, who does? They said, sir, we cannot discuss this with you further. They hung up and blocked his line. This all happened before the stand-up meeting I did for him with Edgar Mitchell, sixth man to walk on the moon, myself, my military advisor, and a few other people met with the Admiral in what's called a stand-up briefing. I was doing the presenting. It was supposed to be 45 minutes. It went for two to three hours. Whew. Okay, why did I read that whole thing? Because those fans of this channel know that I don't like reading long stuff. That gives you the root of what these reputable sources on the Wilson Davis documents are citing that started Admiral Wilson going off and looking for these special access program code names, whatever, and, and then found out what he did was locked out. And then years later, sits in a car with Eric Davis and spills the beans and shares classified information. It goes, however, again, I'm stressing this to the root of UFO Joe's blog that you see on the screen. This is what he says. Wilson said, Oak Shannon, a scientist spoke to him for two hours and tried to convince him to talk to Dr. Davis and what he, Wilson, told Will Miller on April 10th, 1997 in the Pentagon. And then two months later in June, the April date was when the briefing with Miller, Dr. M Mitchell, Dr. Greer, Sher Sherry Adamiak and Stephen Lovekin took place. And when Wilson received the code words from the first page of the NRO documents, Miller and Greer gave him so he could attempt to locate UFO related unacknowledged special access programs. June appears to be the time Wilson told Miller the results of that search. Dr. Mitchell said a gentleman got back to him a few weeks after the April briefing, but I think a few months, June is more likely. And I'm not sure if that person who called Dr. Mitchell was Wilson or Miller. 
I'd go with Miller. Either way, I have no doubt Dr. Mitchell was informed about Wilson found, what Wilson found. I won't start dissecting all those silliness of he said, she said, and then when something doesn't fit the narrative, we switch it. Uh, for example, uh, you know, Wilson sa- or Mitchell says one thing, and then UFO Joe chimes in and says, no, nah, no, nah, it's probably something else. Uh, that, that's problematic with these types of stories. But regardless, you can see here it is solidified that the NRO document is what set Wilson off. It's also reinforced by Richard Dolan. Richard Dolan in his UFO leak of the century video analyzes this and essentially says, uh, the only thing we know from the meeting is from Greer and Mitchell. So he falls back on what Greer said. So again, Richard Dolan, UFO leak of the century phrase coiner uh, is falling back on Greer. So that's the foundation that set Wilson off. I've beat that dead horse and I'll keep beating it. Because what you're about to see is a breakdown of the document that, in my opinion, proves that the entire thing is a fabricated hoax. And so how is it that we call this the UFO leak of the century and so many people who are touting anonymous sources say, hey, this is all real. But no one has ever come to them and say, hey, you guys, look, I don't want to be named in all this, but you're touting a hoaxed document as the root of this story. You need to not do that. Yet no one has challenged what I'm about to show you. Now, those three pages that I went over, I'm going to start dissecting from top to bottom. This up here is obviously a note by Stephen Greer, SG. Okay. So we just omit that. It's not part of the original document. He put it in his book or whatever. You can see this top line from the NRO or National Reconnaissance Office slash Central Security Service. What is this? This is a Department of the Air Force SEAL. Now, government documents, when they are from, in a memo form, when they're from an agency, what do you think is at the top? Another agency's letterhead or their own letterhead? Well, spoiler alert, it would be their own letterhead or their own SEAL or both. Yet here we have something from the National Reconnaissance Office and a Department of the Air Force SEAL. I have never seen a memorandum, and I'll show you some some real ones, from the NRO in these, in any era, doesn't even matter, in any time, an NRO memo that has a U.S. Air Force SEAL. That, from the top, is already silliness, in my opinion. The status of the document classified slash restricted. Neither one of these, by the way, makes sense on a highly classified document, which this is touted to be, that talks about magic and magi and and essentially confirming Majestic 12. That was uh, what Greer is essentially saying. Classified is not a classified designator. It's either confidential secret or top secret then top secret you have special compartmentalized information and that just gets you know really confusing but they are from there on out however classified is not a designator to show a document is classified is restricted yes in world war ii it stopped being a designator after world war ii and was considered uh, a very low level classification but something totally unrelated they, they dealt with a lot of i believe nuclear um, uh, information uh, post-World War II, but was shop, uh, stopped very shortly thereafter. So restricted, no. And plus, when you're confirming the top secret, if the MJ-12 documents are real, and we can, that's a whole nother video in itself, uh, we know that it's top secret, right? So it wouldn't be restricted, even if they were still using it in 1991. But all of those are just hypothetical, speculative whatevers. The reality is they never used classified slash restricted or just classified or just restricted. It's all wrong. Remember I said the memo was from the NRO, the National Reconnaissance Office slash Central Security Service. The CSS, this this kind of designates that it would be a division of the NRO. That's wrong. The CSS is part of the NSA, the National Security Agency. It was started decades prior to this, I believe, but regardless, was never part of the NRO. It was always part of the NSA's mission. So what are we doing here? 
Some may argue, well, maybe it was a memo from both the NRO and the CSS. I've never seen an example like that. It's incredibly doubtful. But regardless, here's your Air Force seal, which screws everything up. So that doesn't make sense either. Here's a fun historical tidbit, which I actually geek out about this stuff, but it's yet another flag that this is all a hoax. This was written in 1991. The National Reconnaissance Office wasn't revealed yet as an as a agency. It started in the 1960s, was revealed, I believe it was 92, uh, but it wasn't revealed yet. And so every time that it was written in a masthead or, or a letterhead, I should say, at the top, it would say National Reconnaissance Office, or whenever the NRO was cited in a document, you would have something really interesting, and it would be an S in parentheses. And the S in parentheses denoted that that particular name, the National Reconnaissance Office, was designated secret in and of itself. So it could be completely unclassified information. But if the NRO wrote it and their letterhead was at the top, it actually had this, an S in a parenthetical, stipulating that in 1990, the NRO, which was working in entire secrecy, it was not known to be uh, public knowledge at all, uh, again, until years later, they would have to have that secret designator on the masthead. Uh, I keep saying masthead, letterhead, excuse me. And that meant that anything created by the NRO would have to hold the classified designator of at least secret because this letterhead alone mandated that. You can see here a secret and a top secret document. And these are real. These were obtained from the Freedom of Information Act. And uh, released in 2019, you could see the top secret and secret designators at the top and bottom. Uh, these are essentially the, um, yeah, we'll call it the compartmentalized information. You need it to have Byman or, or talent keyhole clearances to see this uh, generally about the spy satellites and stuff like that. Anyway, all cool history, but regardless, these are what classified memos, you can see they're both memos, in the same time frame, that three page that we're talking about was 91. This is the end of 1990, beginning of 1990. I couldn't find one from 1991, but regardless, it's the same and uh, how they look. So those are real. I'm going to punch that classified designator again. The top of the document in question didn't have secret or top secret like real ones did. Rather, they just said classified, which is bunk. It's not to say that maybe somewhere in an archive, there's a document with that. I highly doubt it, but, but it, regardless, no, it, it just doesn't happen, especially being written by an agency that what didn't even, didn't even have a, an existence. It was operating within the black. There, there was no public knowledge at all. So they're going to put classified at the top. Not a chance. This was the most fun. This is at the bottom of page three. This document contains information affecting the national security of the United States within description of the Espionage Act, 30 United States Code, chapters 31 and 32, as amended. Its transmission or the revelation of its contents in any manner to an unauthorized person is strictly prohibited by law. It may not be reproduced in whole or in part, by other than United States Air Force Special Security Services, except by permission of the Director of Special Intelligence, T2, U.S. Air Force slash NRO. Espionage Act 30, United States Code 31 and 32. The Espionage Act is actually 18 United States Code, Chapter 37. The citation is wrong. Now, that sounds all good and official, but I looked up exactly what they were referencing. 30 USC 31, Marine Mineral Resources Research. Chapter 32, Methane Hydrate Research and Development. In other words, it's completely bunk. They didn't verify it, and apparently no one else did. That the Espionage Act had nothing to do with the U.S. Code of Federal Regulations that was being cited in the document. 
So from top to bottom, you can see numerous mistakes and that that citation at uh, at the bottom about the T2 NRO USA Air Force Director of Special Intelligence. I, it, it's all hokey. And, and in fact, it's so hokey. I when I first saw it, I thought that there's no way that that was being passed off. Yet that is the root of the story, the foundation of which all of this was built that set Thomas Wilson, Admiral Thomas Wilson off on his journey to go see if these code names were real. And aha, they were. And aha, he had no access to them. And the rest is history. But Admiral Wilson couldn't identify a fake document. I mean, let's say Dr. Stephen Greer got the document to Wilson, like he said, uh, prior to their meeting. Really think about this. He's an admiral and a J2 in the Joint Chiefs of Staff. A private citizen sends him, allegedly, a highly classified document received by either his aide, secretary. I highly doubt that he can just mail it and it goes right into Wilson's hands. Somebody saw it prior. So all of a sudden, all these people are going, oh, cool, classified information. Let's give it to Thomas Wilson and uh, go from there. You don't just send highly classified documents ahead of time from the, a private citizen to a J2 and not get attention. So all of a sudden, Wilson just goes, oh, okay, classified document. Yeah, bring it here. And now he's convinced to look for alien or UFO related special access programs. And so we just have to accept that no one questioned why this type of document was being delivered ahead of time, highly classified in nature from a civilian who's not cleared. Uh, it was not delivered under any special handling procedures or delivered in any way that would be indicative of classified information being delivered to Admiral Thomas Wilson. Instead, we just accept all of that is true, not a problem. Greer got it to him, highly classified, goes under the radar. Wilson just buys the whole thing as being real, despite a lot of red flags that show it was likely a hoax. And he goes, okay, well, let's just, um, you know, let's just look into it. Let's just find aliens. Uh, none of that really makes sense whatsoever. Now, originally I was gonna do two videos. I decided to combine it all into one. The first part, I wanted to show you how awful that document truly is. There's no what we would call chain of custody that people love to talk about. No provenance is how I generally refer it to. There's no Freedom of Information Act case that I'm aware of. Uh, in fact, it does go to a shady character that um, will play a part in an interview I will be posting hopefully later this week. And if you're not watching this live, uh, it may already be there. So I'll put it in the show notes along with the links to everything that I'm talking about. Uh, but I will be interviewing somebody who is entrenched in this story as well, who also believes that that NRO document is likely a hoax. And he has a much different perspective of where it likely came from. And it just reminds me, uh, without knowing all the details yet, of a Richard Doty type character on where this surfaced at the little alien during a uh, conference, you know, in Rachel, Nevada. Yes, that little alien. And that was kind of where this all surfaced. They call it the blue fire memo. It's ridiculous. And, and honestly, I, I mean, if, if I'm proven wrong, please, I'll admit it. But all of those red flags on an NRO document don't make sense. So what I wanted to do was start with that, but lead into some other stuff that in my opinion, really does drop the curtain on this and gives you the final act that there's, despite my great conversation with, with Jay, and I'm glad I did it, digging into these elements of the story, I believe now at this point solidifies that this is fiction. And when the foundation from those reputable resources all point back to Greer's NRO document as what set Wilson off, the foundation starts to fall apart. You can't build a story off of that. You have to buy so much that Wilson would take in a classified document that was a hoax and act on it from a private citizen. It doesn't matter if Edgar Mitchell was attached or not. I truly believe that a J2 would never do that. 
But you have a lot of other stuff as well that I wanted to at least point out that I feel contributes to these, what I call the nails in the coffin on this story, that once your foundation falls apart, the question mark of context really starts to matter. Why did Edgar Mitchell have this document in his archive? And although the assumption is made that he was part of NIDS and that he was given this in a select secret group of individuals by Eric Davis after taking these notes, we don't know that. We don't know from Dr. Edgar Mitchell because he's passed away. We don't know if he was given this as like, oh, look what this guy's trying to pass off. And Mitchell goes, gosh, there is a real element to this story, but this is foobar. This is, there's no, there's no truth to this because I know the reality. We don't know any of that. Did he believe it outright? Quite possibly. Did he think it was a, that certain elements of the notes were fabricated? Quite possibly. We don't know. We know that they were found in his archive. We know they, they were with other UFO material, but that doesn't matter. That doesn't mean anything. We need to know why he had them. And, and to Jay's credit, he admitted we don't really have that part of the story. So we have to assume the context of why that document was there. One of the biggest elements to my, uh, I wanted to preface my video with Jay that it, I didn't consider it a formal debate, but everybody calls it that. So for sake of argument, that's how I'll refer to it as, uh, that, that the conversation really turned heavily on the no comment debate. That essentially when people say no comment, that that is associated with a confirmation. That essentially if you go, oh, phew, I can't talk about that. Everybody goes, aha, see, he can't talk about it. No means yes. And only in ufology do you really have that, where if somebody says no comment, then it's a, a, a confirmation. So I asked Jay, and, and I put this out to any of you. I started asking those that I knew. I mean, I've, I've met a lot of people in 25 years doing the Black Vault. A lot of people have clearances and a lot of people that I speak with have no interest in UFOs whatsoever, even though it's incredibly popular on this channel, but started asking just, just these people, two of which are active in the Pentagon at the moment, as we speak, as I record this, and I reached out to them and asked a hypothetical situation about commenting on classified information. Across the board of those that I asked to, again, a couple which work in the Pentagon and outside, but, but for a contractor, and they have an active clearance, high level, I said, what happens? Like if, if, I ha if I'm doing an interview with you and I'm, and I'm asking about your Sunday barbecue, and I go, hey, so-and-so, I've got this document, and I put it on screen, and uh, allegedly classified, leaked out, it was sent to me through Signal or whatever, could you comment on it and put your name to it? You can tell me it's a hoax. You can tell me it's real. You can tell me there's 50% truth, whatever. Can you comment across the board? Everybody said, no, the reason is, is because you essentially, uh, and, and these are my words, uh, but from what I gathered, you're essentially working as a spokesperson talking on behalf of the U S government, either labeling it a hoax, either labeling it as real or labeling it as a hybrid pardon the pun of truth and fiction. And so if you do not have that sanction from the U S government to speak on their behalf, then you, you can't do it because it could be 98% bunk. And that 2% that you're now labeling a hoax, or you're now confirming is real, or you're alluding to the fact that it, you're, you're in a breach because you are now treading into very dangerous territory. And what I walked away from those, uh, again, I didn't publish anything. It was, it was, I talked to a lot of people researching these types of videos and a, the, uh, two of them who don't know each other said the exact same phrase, which is playing with fire. Uh, and it's, and it's like that phrase really resonates with those with, with high level clearance holders that if you start going out there and talking about potentially classified information, you're playing with fire, you're going to get burned. And it doesn't matter if it's an obvious hoax that you just don't touch it. You, you're playing with fire. Even if it's, if it's something that, you know, is, is an obvious hoax, they don't touch it. Well, that wasn't good enough for me. I had to go get people on the record. So I reached out to Lou Elizondo. You all know the name. 
And despite what you may or may not believe that he did or didn't do, I reached out to him because he's the former director of the National Programs Special Management Staff, or the NPSMS. Uh, I had dug in on that. Uh, I have a video about how I connected him to the trial of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the 9-11 mastermind that had never been out before. I am super intrigued by that angle of his career. And that is one that is not disputed, nor had I ever disputed it, uh, despite the highly critical angle on being the director of ATIP that I've had uh, in that whole debate. I know that for some it's settled. I mean, I'm still digging. It doesn't matter for me what I believe or don't believe. I'm still digging into it. But the NPSMS part was uh, not disputed. And there's highly classified situations that I know for a fact that he dealt with. And so I thought, you know what? He's an authority on security access. And so I posed a 100% fictionalized scenario. And I told him, that it was a 100% fictionalized scenario. And my scenario was that if I came to him with an alleged leaked document, classified, uh, potentially classified, even if he knew it was a hoax or, or wrong, based on the knowledge he had being a clearance holder, could he tell me it was a hoax? Could he tell me that it was real? Could he comment at all? And that was my framing, but I'm stressing that I told him it was fictitious, and I told him that I did not have a classified document, which I did not, and wanted his feedback on how that would be handled. His quote, in part, if the document has both real and fake info within it, then it becomes a much more difficult situation and one which would not permit comment on. In essence, no comment because you get into a dicey situation. So he, being the former director of the NPA SMS, went on the record for me. The last thing I'll stress before I move on, this was not an endorsement of my angle on this. Again, I posed that 100% fictionalized scenario. He was not endorsing my view. He was not denouncing it. He wasn't denouncing or endorsing anyone else. This was just on a, a fictionalized scenario, but that was his comment. Researching this video, I also stumbled upon another one by a familiar name, Jim Semivan. He's obviously connected to TTSA. Obviously, you know, a lot of mystique around his character. Uh, but during an interview with Melinda Leslie, I believe in 2020, he was asked about the Wilson Davis notes. He said as well, we have to say no comment because of our clearances still. We are bound by our oaths. We have these oaths till our death. Even if one sentence in the document is classified or dealing with something that is, we cannot comment on the entire document. Yet again, more evidence that tiny sliver of potential truth is what throws us into this no comment arena. And so there you have it. If you don't want to take my word for it, take Luis Elizondo's and Jim Semivans along with quite a few other people with clearance holders that will likely say the same thing, that you're playing with fire. So in other words, all of these no comments that people are saying, well, they could have denied it. They could have, but they didn't. Don't, don't, I'm sorry, it doesn't mean anything. So in my opinion, we need to just take that out of the equation because these gentlemen who I got on the record, well, one on the record with me, Jim Semivan on the record with Melinda Leslie, all say the same thing. It's that little tiny sliver of truth, which makes every fictionalized story that much better. If you put a couple nuggets of truth in it, build off of that, you got yourself a great story. And those with clearances are going to be put in a pickle if you ask them to comment on it. Now, I know what some of you might be thinking, but Admiral Wilson denied it. So if my stance were true, why couldn't? Admiral, why could Admiral Wilson deny it and essentially make a comment? For that, I believe there's an easy addressing of it. He's a former J2 and former director of the Defense Intelligence Agency. Those are two very high ranking positions. That's much higher than people like Dr. Eric Davis and Hal Putoff, who are often cited as saying no comment. Why I want to punch his position, Admiral Wilson's, 
is that that puts him in a release authority position as a director of the DIA, not when he's a former director, but rather while he is a director. What a release authority means is that essentially he can be asked whether or not information should or should not be released, let's say through the Freedom of Information Act, or let's say through litigation. So even though not all roads lead to him when you get to a FOIA case or litigation, you're the director of the DIA. So you have cognizance over all things DIA. And that makes him a release authority, a very powerful position. Davis and Putoff would not be the release authority of anything. So they would likely have to fall back on the no comment. But being the release authority puts him in a position to essentially have a heck of a lot of contacts. So even though he was asked when he was a former director, he has the authority to denounce uh, it, and, and let me preface this by saying, I think that the two things could happen here being in those strong positions. He has the authority to denounce a legal claim against him because the document allegedly said he broke the law and violated his security oath. So my guess, and this is speculation. So again, I'm still searching for an animation that goes <coughs> speculation that he may be able to being, uh, in his former positions, if he's accused of legally doing something that broke the law, that he can say no. The other part of this that no one can answer, not me either, I'm not pretending I can, uh, but I would love to ask Admiral Wilson that when he learned about this, which of these scenarios is true, the one I just said, or potentially that he picked up the phone and called the proper authority within the Joint Chiefs of Staff the Defense Intelligence Agency, the Department of Defense, or whatever office he felt could give him the authority then to in turn deny the documents. No one can answer that. Has anybody talked to Wilson? Yeah, very few people. Have they asked him that? Not that I'm aware of. But regardless, I believe one of those two scenarios would allow him to deny it, defend himself, but also he picks up the phone and he gets the authority to speak out against it. And he goes, hey, look, this is total poppycock. Uh, can I denounce it? And they go, yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, permission granted. And he goes out and he, and he gives the statements that he did. Some of which were to Stephen Greenstreet from the New York Post. Now, these graphics are his, so my compliments to Stephen Greenstreet. Uh, he hosts the basement office. And he posted these, and I thought I would uh, make reference to them because I think this is another silly part of the overall debate that Thomas Wilson said to Stephen Greenstreet, it's ridiculous. None of the things in that memo are true. I'm denying this meeting ever occurred. It's all BS. He also said, I don't even know who Eric Davis is. I may have crossed paths with him at some time, but I don't know who he is. And people take those types of comments. He's given them to Stephen Greenstreet, but also a shout out to uh, journalist Billy Cox, who has written a lot about this, talked to Wilson, tracked him down, also denied the whole thing that happened. People point to the notes and the notes say, if you blow my trust, I'll deny meeting you and deny everything said. And some people go, aha, I told you this was real because it said he was going to deny it and he denied it. This is all the anatomy of a hoax. So even if you believe the documents are real, just for sake of the next 60 seconds, assume that you are a hoaxer and you're creating a document and whatever motivation you have, how easy is it to put a line in there and go, look, this person I'm making a claim against, they're going to deny it. So I'll write in there. If they deny it, then people will think it's true. And they put it in there. If this gets out, I'll deny it. I'm sorry, but that, that doesn't mean anything. Any hoaxer that has any kind of knowledge whatsoever of hoaxing things would put something like that in there. So for me, it's silly to fall back on that and go, well, Wilson's denying it, but the note said he would. So, you know, we, we've got to believe him uh, or believe that he's lying and he's a big fat liar. Uh, I, I don't, I don't buy it. You know, and, and again, I just, if you believe the documents, just remove yourself for a second. What does that show you? And it's absolutely nothing. The only thing it shows you is the hoax or thought ahead, to be honest with you. So here's another one that may not be popular. Uh, Dr. Putoff and Dr. Davis can deny it all too, then, if it's all a hoax. Well, I just went over why Admiral Wilson would 
you know, potentially be in the power to comment on it versus somebody at a much lower level, like put off and Davis. Um, but I'm going to say something that that again, won't be popular. And that is Dr. Put off, but more so Dr. Davis really strike me as gentlemen that like the aura and mystique around them, that they want the idea that they're more in the know than anyone else. They want that. That's part of who they are. Uh, Jay, in my interview with him, brought up the ego on his own about Eric Davis, and I put no argument for me. So this part is more against Dr. Davis than Dr. Putoff. But again, they both strike me as individuals that like that mystique, that like that they are the power players within this entire saga that knows more than you, that they are more privileged. And that's what, honestly, what I feel after seeing these types of interviews, seeing how they talk, seeing how they essentially put their no comments out there and strategically say things. I think there's a reason for it that maybe they actually can deny it and they choose not to just because it's fun. Sounds silly. Some of you will hate me for it, but if you watch their interviews, that's absolutely the impression that I get. So the bottom line with all of that is no does not mean yes. The no comment is not an affirmation. And truly, it, it, it seems like by speaking not only to Jay, because I don't want to seem like I'm picking on him, but when you read these mega blogs and you read you know, people saying that this is the leak of the century and so on and so forth, they really read into those no comments and inflection of voices and they could have denied it, but they didn't. I'm sorry, no does not mean yes. So if you take all of that out of the story and you look at Luis Elizondo and Jim Semivan and the, the, the reality behind secret keeping, you don't have much left of this story. You really don't. I mean, there's, there's a lot of names and there's a lot of he said, she said. If you're going to change the world with this story, you need to do better than that. And that is my entire point. But another big point that I think people miss is why. I mean, let's use some common sense and logic. Why Dr. Eric Davis? Now, he had a security clearance level. Uh, yeah, he did. It was at high level SAP access. No, he wasn't working on black budget programs. He was working on propulsion ideas and designs, ball lightning, and a couple other Air Force um, contracts that he had done. Excuse me, that he had done. Uh, those aren't black budget programs. Those are some contracts that were farmed out for some hypothetical research. Uh, he likely had to get into some classified arenas. Hey, great. I, I like that. There's nothing bad about that. And I'm not knocking it. But I don't believe a J2 would go. I found out about aliens. So I'm going to go tell Dr. Eric Davis in hopes that he will be able to spearhead a movement to get this all out in the open. Because when I asked Jay, that seemed like a potential of the motivating factor for Wilson to do that. And Jay also brought up Robert Bigelow, a billionaire who was running NIDS at the time. Oak Shannon apparently vouched for Davis as the story goes. I believe that that, that part of the element was given to Wilson that he was trustworthy. So he sits in a car and he spills all the secrets. But really use some common sense and think, why Eric Davis? You have a multitude of people that Admiral Wilson probably had in his Rolodex from skunk work executives to probably even lower level, you know, people with high level clearances working on black budget programs. He likely saw a lot in his day. And somebody said, oh, Eric Davis, he's trustworthy. And he goes, aha, that's that's my guy. And I'm going to go out and I'm going to tell him everything when it comes to aliens. I don't see it. So really, did he think that that would get him into Bigelow? Well, that's silly. Just call Robert Bigelow. But the problem with that is all he had was money. And I'm sure someone like Wilson could find somebody with money outside of Robert Bigelow. So did he have access? And the answer was no. NIDS didn't have any high level black budget programs going on. Sure, Bass got a top secret level access uh, for OSAP years later, but that was eight, that was six years from happening. So why NIDS? A couple scientists, they were going out studying Skinwalker Ranch. 
uh, you know, that, that, why would Wilson think that that was, that was the key to exposing this? It would keep Wilson's name safe, but he would put it out there and, and NIDS would change the world. Yet they didn't have any access, none. So what was he going to do? Go on 60 Minutes? Okay, Wilson can go as an insider, anonymous insider to 60 Minutes himself. So why wouldn't he do that? So none of the motive for this makes sense. If you're going to blow your security oath because you want to anonymously invoke change to give the biggest secret of humanity, then I'll ask it. Why would you choose any of the people that we've been talking about? It's not meant to be insulting, but using logic and common sense, they're not your guys. I'm sorry. They're just not. If this involved some black budget corporation and a scientist with a proven track record of black budget programs, access, SAP access, something. Sure, I can get on board. But these guys, we'll get into more of that in a couple minutes. To kind of punch the point too of, of Wilson's access and his Rolodex, uh, here's a brief rundown of his chronology around what he was doing within the US government at the time that this all allegedly happened. We know April of 97 was that original Greer meeting where he saw the NRO document and was uh, persuaded to go take a look. During that time frame, November of 94 to September of 97, he was the vice director for intelligence. That's called the VJ2 of the joint staff in the Pentagon. September 97, uh, he was a rear admiral at the time. He gets promoted later. Uh, Wilson commenced a short tour of duty at the CIA, where he served as the Associate Director of Central Intelligence for Military Support. March 1998, assigned as the Joint Staff Director of Intelligence J2, a Defense Intelligence Agency billet operationally allocated to the Joint Staff. May of 99, nominated and later confirmed and promoted to Vice Admiral as the 13th Director of the DIA. His career would go on to 29 July 2002, where he was relieved as being the director of the DIA, replaced by Admiral Lowell Jake Jacobs, uh, J Jacoby, excuse me, of the U.S. Navy. That is a heck of a resume. He had a lot of contact within the DOD and the Joint, Ch uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff within the CIA there for a while. You're telling me that in the years from September of 1997... Uh, or excuse me, April 97, when the um, uh, first meeting happened, he was in the joint staff at that, at that point until September. So through there, the CIA going back to the DIA, uh, the, or the joint staff, but then to the DIA, you're telling me the years of service that he gave Eric Davis and Robert Bigelow were the best choice to get this out all founded well, I won't, I won't beat the dead horse. There's more context is where I'm going with that. Now, chronology of Dr. Eric Davis also may play a role in this. He was quoted as saying, my last day at NIDS was April 30th, 2002, because my job got eliminated to cut the NIDS payroll. So payroll was cut, Davis out. His current LinkedIn, as of the day of recording this interview, here's his chronology, July of 96 to April of 2002. He worked for NIDS. So that coincides with the statement he gave to UFO Joe. For those watching versus listening, I put the source up here. It's also in the show notes below. January of 2002 to December of 2010, he was the CEO and chief scientist for Warp Drive Metrics. If you dig into that company, that's Eric Davis's company. That's the one the checks were written to from the Air Force Research Lab. Those documents I also got through Freedom of Information Act, which broke down uh, Eric's work. Then in November 2004, so you'll see some overlap there that his company was also overlapping this to what his LinkedIn says present, but who knows uh, if he's still working for him, Earth Tech International and the Institute of Advanced Studies at Austin. That is Dr. Hal Putoff's corporation and uh, outfit. So he owns that. So Eric Davis obviously was entrenched there. I did a video like a year or two ago about it, and they were talking how Eric Davis left that corporation, was no longer working with them, but he was still on the website. I noted that at the time. I looked a couple of weeks ago, he's still on the website. 
He's still on LinkedIn as working for him. I don't know. Is that just a mistake, oversight, whatever? They're obviously still together. Uh, Davis now works for Aerospace Corporation. That is not on his LinkedIn that I saw uh, before recording this. But regardless, it's public knowledge that that is where he is. One of the other things now, now you see those connections and the chronology, the, the alleged meeting with Wilson Davis was kind of smack in the middle of it, October of 2002, uh, ironically months, uh, after he was let go from, from NIDS. Um, I go back to the motivating factor that, that, uh, Bigelow can do something about this. So maybe Davis was the trustworthy thing. Davis wasn't even working for Robert Bigelow at the time. He was months out from being ousted because of no money for him so yet again another weird thing like why would wilson choose a guy uh that wasn't even involved in the corporation he wanted to kind of get into to change humanity didn't really make sense but around this time frame it should be noted uh that uh what is largely determined to be a hoax this project serpo surfaced around 2005 so not too long after uh, Eric Davis was was entrenched with Dr. Hal put off and so on and so forth. Robert Schaefer, who runs a blog, obviously known more as a skeptic and a debunker, really did kind of give a good brief summation of what Project Sopra was because it gets really confusing and all sorts of stuff. I'm going to read it to you. So you uh, this is a video in itself, and I don't envision myself ever doing it because uh, it's silliness. Uh, but this is the summation by Robert Schaefer. Uh, so credit to him. A meeting was set for April 1964 when an alien craft landed near Alamogordo, New Mexico. Upon retrieving the bodies of their dead comrades, the extraterrestrials engaged in an information exchange that was carried out in English, thanks to the alien's translation device. One thing led to another, and in 1965, the aliens accepted to take a group of humans back to their planet as part of the exchange program. Twelve military personnel were carefully sele selected for a 10-year stay on Serpo, the 10 men and two women were specialists in various fields and their task was to gather as much information as possible regarding all aspects of life, society, and technology on the alien planet. They were three years late and four, year, uh, and four people short when they finally returned to Earth in 1978. Two men had died on the alien planet. One man and one woman had decided to stay. The journey to Serpo, located 37 light years from Earth, took only nine months aboard the alien craft. That's Project Serpo. Again, largely thought of as a hoax, it's silliness. Now, why am I bringing this up? Well, it's interesting to note that there were some emails because every good story has a leak. And the leaked emails, which no, as far as I know, no one's denied, um, gave some indicators on who was involved. And that would be Dr. Hal Putoff. Here's some of the emails. I don't know who besides the two of you know that Hal, myself, and Rick, meaning Richard Doty, are working an issue together on Serpo. Now that was written by Kit Green, another familiar name, all entrenched in the Project Serpo story. Here we are outlining that Dr. Putoff, Kit Green, and Richard Doty are working on something related to Project Serpo. But also in Kit Green's words, Serpo is not true. It's a hoax because it looks like a hoax, smells like a hoax, feels like a hoax. Another one, he says, Kit Green, the Project Serpo stuff is 50% true, mixed with 50% untrue to allow plausible deniability as is done officially all the time. And that there is a battle going on with some of the insiders now being in power to stop the Serpo release officially, saying, we told you so, those clowns can't manage the release with their boy spy games. What does all this mean? Like they're obviously entrenched in all of this silliness. Are we really led to believe that Dr. Hal Putoff either hoaxed this or truly believes that we traveled to an alien planet? Like, why, why are these names always coming up in these ridiculous narratives? And, and it goes on for years. And, and we look at the chronology, we realize Dr. Eric Davis is entwined in all of this. You have Stephen Greer's fake NRO document. I'm sorry, I think we've established that. You have Project Serpo, which has absolutely no supporting evidence. And yet you see Dr. Hal put off in that. And you see all of these names in the same types of ridiculous stories, but they're all running in the same circles. Now, if that doesn't convince you, you know who else was working for Dr. Hal Putoff at the time that Dr. Eric Davis then goes to join his, his group? 
the the one and only Richard Doty, the controversial character who has been entwined in so many ridiculous stories. We have no idea like what he's trying to claim is true anymore or what is true or what isn't because his, of his past. Dr. Hal put off when this surfaced because Richard Doty published a bio when he did a, a lecture that he worked for Hal put off. And that was a surprise and revelation at the time because no one really knew that. Hal put off was asked in 2020, what was called the transition talk. Did Richard Doty really work for you? Cause nobody believes Doty on anything that he says anymore because he's got such a shady past to my surprise. It was true. In Hal Putoff's words, and, and this is just the chunk of it, I invite you all to, to watch the entire talk, uh, also linked in the show notes. He says, and he, meaning Richard Doty, had stated that he had worked for us, I guess, for over a decade. And Hal Putoff goes on to some other details of why, and Doty was collecting all this information. And then he sum, uh, summarizes it all saying, what he says is true. What Richard Doty says is true. So for 10 years... Richard Doty was working for Hal Putoff, the mastermind between um, the mastermind of disinformation. Sorry, but you look at the Paul Benowitz story, you look at Richard Doty, you know, and, and his long line of ridiculous comments and stories. That's who was that's who was working for Hal Putoff at the same time that Dr. Eric Davis was. And so. Someone later in the presentation asked him, was this prior to ATIP? Like, did Doty have something to do with ATIP? Uh, more accurately, it should have been uh, OSAP. And Hal Potoff says, no, this was another program before ATIP. Essentially, he was working for Putoff, uh, likely not on a government contract. And if it was, I'll have a field day with that one. But regardless, it just sounds like Richard Doty was in there bringing information to Hal at that time. So I'll ask the question again, why is it that these same names keep appearing over and over and over? And I have no idea why. Now, here's a flashback. Here's a very young and much skinnier me with the late Dr. Edgar Mitchell. He was an American hero. And for me to do these types of videos where I essentially go against what he believed, or which you'll see in a minute, ask a tough question, that's tough for me. Uh, you guys met weeks ago, uh, my father who called into one of the shows who was heavily entrenched in the space program. I got to meet quite a few astronauts through his work, but have the utmost respect. So it's not fun for me to say this, but what I want to punch because I keep getting these, these comments is that it's not an insult to Edgar Mitchell to believe that he was potentially misled because there's a lot of fallback on, well, Dr. Mitchell said it, so it has to be true. And even though he was an American hero and somebody I respected highly and respect highly, but obviously the late Dr. Edgar Mitchell, it doesn't, it doesn't insult the man to question whether or not what he was told was true. And what level of bar did he have set that we are, are either aware or unaware of? And it sounds like we don't know. We, we really don't. We have some interviews where he talked about it. And he goes out and he says uh, that the Admiral was denied access and that's fine. How do we know that wasn't fed to him through Dr. Stephen Greer and that in itself was fabricated? Do, do we have the recording of Thomas Wilson calling Edgar Mitchell? I know that that may seem like an insulting step, but it's not because there's no proof. So it's quite possible that Edgar Mitchell took Greer at his word, but Edgar Mitchell was not dumb. Because around uh, 2001, and this actually goes around the time frame that I was writing way back then for UFO Magazine, Bill Burns' UFO Magazine, researching Greer's disclosure conference. And Greer essentially fabricated quite a few things that I had written about, but, but one of them was talking about the disclosure witnesses and the eyewitnesses naming Dr. Edgar Mitchell and dropping his name essentially fabricating part of the story to make himself look better. Essentially, I've got Dr. Edgar Mitchell, you know, the, the I think, sixth, sixth man that walk on the moon, and, and he's a witness. Well, Dr. Mitchell was ticked, and he didn't like that at all. Uh, I had um, 
written about some of that and ended up uh, kind of uh, not publishing a lot because what I had found out through uh, digging into the Disclosure Project witnesses, and I'm going away from uh, Edgar Mitchell here, is that a lot of them were not vetted. Now, some of them absolutely were and were incredibly credible. So I'm not saying it was across the board, but there were a lot of question marks on the credibility of Dr. Stephen Greer's vetting process. So when I wrote the article, some of which got published, I believe the Edgar Mitchell thing was, was uh, well documented at this point, because you can all find this article online, but also quite a few places. And Edgar Mitchell also talks about the fact that he didn't work with Dr. Stephen Greer anymore. But how do we know that the belief that Admiral Wilson was truly denied access to an alien technology sap wasn't fed to him in 1997 or 1998 by Dr. Stephen Greer. I know people point to Will Miller, but Will Miller was working for Dr. Stephen Greer. Now I'll say up front, I don't know Will Miller, but yet again, the key figure in this that supports the whole narrative was working directly with Dr. Stephen Greer who upset Edgar Mitchell for fabricating stuff and who allegedly gave Thomas Wilson this hoaxed NRO document, which set him off on this journey. If it looks like a duck and smells like a duck, um, it's not a watermelon. And all signs are pointing that this is absolute based on fiction. And I don't understand why some people advocating for the documents, calling it leak of the century, so on and so forth, aren't making the stand saying, you know what, that document that, that Greer's touting, that is a hoax. That's not how the story went. Instead, it's told to us by the biggest advocates that this all is real as just how it happened. No question, you know, nothing to see here. Uh, move along. Thomas Wilson saw these classified code names and, and, and aha, found alien tech. Nobody's questioning that. It's not fun for me. I mean, I, I love research, but at this point, it's like beating a dead horse, but no one else is talking about it. And that's what's frustrating. And when you say something long enough and you say something that people want to believe, it becomes fact. And then no one wants to question it because, well, Richard Dolan told us and, and UFO Joe told us and Jay told us and and, and so on told us, you know, so-and-so told us, we don't question it anymore. And this is not an insult to any of those that I just mentioned, but rather a question that I think we all should ask. Why is it that no one is asking these questions? And what was interesting was uh, I posed the question and tagged Joe, I think Rich, uh, Jay from Project Unity, and Omni Talk Radio and asked the question, you know, is this is this document really the foundation? And uh, to, to Jay's credit, pretty much said that, that 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 element of the story was, you know, what is being told. And he didn't try and, and backtrack or anything like that. UFO Joe chimed in and said, well, that's just not the most compelling part of the story. Well, it doesn't matter if it's the most compelling part or not. It's the foundation, according to those sources that I've already mentioned, that have published it and touted it as real. And until they come out and either correct the record or tell you I'm full of it, I'm looking forward to that evidence. I want to see how that NRO document is legit. But why is it no one is doing that? Rather, they're telling you it's real. And to prove it, now that we can disprove the NRO stuff, they have sources that, that, that reinforce their stance. They're anonymously sourced statements that support their viewpoint that they pass on to you and say, you have to believe this. Uh, I don't, I don't believe it. So we <laughs> disprove the hoax document and we'll see where that actually leads us because to be honest with you, I don't think they can get out of it. So now they have to justify the foundation of this and if they can't, then they have to buy a hoax document and they have to buy that Wilson was, was persuaded by this hoax, this fake fraudulent document that set all of this in motion. Now, one of the things I also got a lot of heat for was asking a question to Jay 
that Edgar Mitchell believed that he was cured from cancer remotely by a teenage healer known as Adam Dream Healer. Now, it was never confirmed Edgar Mitchell had cancer. He just uh, had a scan that was indicative of it. And then later he felt uh, that he was cancer free. Now, this is an uncomfortable thing to bring up, but it's important when we're talking about the Wilson Davis notes in that this American hero, which I am not trying to insult, had fringe beliefs. Now, whether or not he was truly healed remotely by a teenager by the name of Adam Dream Healer, I don't know. He could very well have been healed. But by Dr. Mitchell's own admission, he never had a scan or excuse me, a biopsy to prove that he had cancer to document the healing. Rather, he talked about a scan that may have uh, been indicative of a carcinoma. I forget what the whole uh, legal term was, but he admitted that and he believed that he was cured from cancer remotely. Now, in my opinion, and I wanted to say this, it's not insulting to question the level of evidence that translates to a belief for someone versus the level of evidence that actually supports an irrefutable fact. Now, what do I mean by that? Edgar Mitchell may have truly believed that he was cured, and maybe he was. I'm not here to say he wasn't. But by his own admission, he did not have that biopsy to prove a cancer and then a vanishing of said cancer, but rather he believed it. And that's fine. That's not insulting to question the level of evidence that's required for this man. And if he truly believed that based on very little evidence, that's fine. I'm not here to say he wasn't cured by, by cancer. But it shows you the level of evidence required to believe something to be true. And so if Greer was the one that came to him and said, oh, Wilson did look into it and he didn't find anything, then uh, Edgar Mitchell just may believe that. He didn't have any reason to believe in the late 1990s that Greer was a liar. And then in 2001, when he got upset that Greer was fabricating about Edgar Mitchell being a witness, maybe he didn't want to believe that that element of Greer's story was not true, but rather just spoke out about clearing his name. And so we don't know if he kind of locked himself into this story or operating off the assumption it was true with absolutely no evidence whatsoever. Now, I'm sure there's a variation of this story that said Wils or Mitchell got the call, but the ones that I've seen, uh, he says, we collectively, like we, we got the call. Okay, well, did you talk to him? And I haven't really heard that interview where Mitchell says, I was the one that spoke to him. So if this was second or third hand information and Greer and the person working for him, which happens to be another big name in the story, Will Miller, who again was working for Dr. Stephen Greer, how do we know any of that wasn't as fabricated as that NRO document? And we absolutely don't know. One of the other arguments that I saw that I really feel should be addressed was that the notes aren't a government document, so it's not classified, so anyone can comment on it. So this is kind of calling back to the no comment stuff. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Where I want to clear this up is that classified information is classified information. And let's just use a hypothetical to prove my point, and I'll go through this quickly. This is a schematic and breakdown of the B-2 stealth bomber. Obviously, there was a time where stuff like this was incredibly sensitive and highly classified before the B-2 stealth bomber was ever known. The mindset that the, the notes are not a government document, so ergo not classified, is silly. Imagine a skunk works guy coming out and he scribbled these schematics on a piece of toilet paper. That doesn't mean he can go flash around the toilet paper with the schematics of the B2 on it simply because it's toilet paper. The contents of the toilet paper are classified. So that type of argument we need to dismiss. Uh, and I've seen that a lot. So I felt there was a need that we needed to dismiss that as, as part of this argument. Classified information is classified information. The 
Discovery Channel interview, as references the Discovery Channel interview in my uh, show with Jay, I was unaware of this interview. He had uh, read part of the quote, and I want to read it to you. And there's a reason why I think this will be, I think this will be one of the last things that I'll, I'll read in full. Uh, but it's important because it goes into one of the last points I want to make. This is what Edgar Mitchell said to Discovery Channel that, that Jay had referenced, and I want to read it. My major knowledge comes from what I call the old timers, people who were at Roswell and subsequent who wanted to clear the things up and tell somebody credible, even though they were under severe threats and things. This was back in the Roswell days. Having gone to the moon and being a local citizen out in the Roswell area, some of them thought I would be a safe choice to tell their story to, which they did. Even though the government put real clamps on everybody, it got out anyhow. Subsequent to that, I did take my story to the Pentagon, not NASA, but the Pentagon, and asked for a meeting with the intelligence community uh, committee of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and got it, and told them my story and what I know and eventually had them confirmed by the Admiral that I spoke with that indeed what I was saying was true. Discovery Channel producer says, you mean what had been told to you was true? Edgar Mitchell, yep, in other words, there was a UFO crash, there was an alien spacecraft, this gentleman tried his damnedest to get me in, and like so many others had been in the administration over the last 60 years since JFK's time, was unable to. He was told, Admiral, you don't have a need to know, and therefore go get lost, essentially. Producer from Discovery, have you ever come out and said who this person was who briefed you? No, I have not. Would you at some point? No, it is out and around, but I don't feel like I have the liberty to do that. When did you have your meeting at the Pentagon? It was in the late 90s in Washington when I was there working with the Disclosure Project, trying to get all those opened up with another naval officer by the name of Will Miller and Stephen Greer, who you probably heard of. Stephen and I don't really work on this anymore together, but we did at that point, and getting to the Pentagon and seeing what we could do there to try and get this opened up. So there he calls back. Obviously, he was not happy with Stephen Greer. And it plays into where did that where did that phone call come from? Uh, and we don't know. So there's a lot of different one of the other things too, not to veer way off is how all of this happened. Uh, and, and who initiated the meeting and who got it. And when you really read into the words about how Edgar Mitchell tells the story and Dr. Stephen Greer tells the story and they all want to say like, I was asked to do this or I did that or I did that. And it contradicts each other. Sure, those are semantics and we can kind of dig in and and uh, and be petty with, with fact checking. But it just seems like there's too many holes in the story to overlook that, that these stories do not coincide. The chronology uh, in brief is this. So we've gone over a lot of this, but I'll go over it one last time because there's a point that I want to make here. 97, April, it sounds like, Pentagon meeting with Wilson, Greer, Will Miller, etc. 2001, Greer Disclosure Project Talk, September 2001 in Portland, Oregon. He stops the story at being denied access. And this is going to play into my point here. The notes were written in 2002, meaning Wilson met with Davis and went into this long diatribe about meeting in a secure vault of the contractor and was essentially confirmed all of the classified information in broad strokes, but confirmed classified information on a project he didn't have access to. So everybody who's told the story, including Edgar Mitchell and Stephen Greer, essentially stopped that the Admiral tried, but was denied. Greer says, I think he was hung up on. Mitchell says that he tried, but was denied. But in all of these interviews, nobody gives the details that the notes had. And if these were passed around in 2002 to NIDS, that meant that Edgar Mitchell would have them. Dr. Stephen Greer likely would have them. In 2006, Hidden Truth, Forbidden Knowledge, Book Passage, that's the one I, I uh, has, have posted on Twitter, I'll post it down, uh, but essentially stops Greer stops the story that he was denied access. July 4th, 2008, Edgar Mitchell on CNN, Larry King, also stops the story that he was denied access. July of what I just read to you. I don't know what day. I couldn't figure out exactly what day it was posted. Same thing. Discovery Channel interview. Edgar Mitchell stops at it being uh, he was denied access and that was it. 
No one can argue the climax of the story within the notes is the fact that Wilson, although was denied access, flies out to the government contractor, gets to meet with the attorneys and the contract heads and stuff like that, program managers in a secure location. He's confirmed that there's alien technology and uh, essentially all of those details. And yet no one has talked about that. Why? You don't have to blow Wilson's cover. You don't have to blow the private contractor's cover if they knew it. You don't have to go any farther than what you've already done and, and retell the story. And sadly, with, with all of these interviews, it proves that all of those extra details in the notes aren't there. The climax of the story. Like, why wouldn't he say the Admiral flew out and he sat in a secure vault and he was told all of this was true? No, none of that is there. Anyone across the board. And it's almost like the Eric Davis, Thomas Wilson notes were built on a fragment of truth and fictionalized considerably. There's no way around it. When you look at the hoax document that led Wilson off, sure, the Wilson notes don't mention the NRO document, but it mentions MJ-12 as being real. It's all the same stuff. It's all the same narrative that Dr. Stephen Greer had created, and it was all originated from. And going back to the beginning of this presentation, none of that is disputed. The biggest advocates that these documents are real fall back on Stephen Greer. The one who has been caught, in my opinion, red-handed, fictionalizing stories, upset Edgar Mitchell by doing so, touting a fake NRO document, it all goes to him as the foundation that leads all this off. So does it matter that the notes don't mention a NRO document specifically? Not at all, because everyone else does, and everyone else points to Stephen Greer. And that fictionalized element which has spawned off all of these other details. No one involved in the story during this time was actually talking about those details. Why not? Allegedly, those notes were floating around for years, and yet no one talked about the fact that Wilson met with the program man managers or referred to him anonymously as the Admiral or whatever. There's no reason not to tell the climax of the story, and yet everybody left it out. Now, I know that the TV script theory is, you know, one that that is uh, often chided by those that <laughs> advocate for the, the documents being real. But I want to address something that I think still, after all the videos and interviews that I've done, hasn't resonated to some. Now, I believe the core audience that I have here, you guys and gals actually listen to me. So I'll, this is more so to those who haven't understood the fact that I don't say that it is a TV script. I say it's possible that it is. The intent with posing the theory is something that I feel we have to address, that there are other more plausible scenarios here, and don't call it a TV script or movie script. Call it a, a, an outline for a book. Call it a you know creative exercise that somebody wanted to do. Call it whatever you want, I don't care, but the fictionalized aura is there. And, and so fill in the blank on what you want to call it. That was my intent. Now, the theory is often dismissed and, and often ridiculed by those believing that this is real, but they can't tell you why. But in fairness to Jay, he gave me a reason, which I appreciated. He said the evidence or similarities to a script uh, don't prove it. So there, there are no similarities there. And so you, so you have to essentially not consider it. But I would argue that you absolutely can consider it using the same exact method that a lot of these other players are using to prove it's true. Now, we can assume certain facts and get to the point where we believe that this is a movie script or TV script. We can read into certain things and read between the lines of statements that lack any specificity, but we can give it specificity. We can read between the lines and go, I think he was talking about a scene call on that one or whatever. We can make those things up to get us to a determined conclusion. We stretch the known facts. We make up the middle 
and we can make that line to an already determined conclusion. And the holes, the gaps, that's easy. I have a long list of anonymous sources that will do just that, that they will fill in those gaps and promise you that this is a movie or TV script. Now, I won't tell you who they are, and you can't figure them out. You just have to trust me. Now, if all of those things are something that you allow me to do, that's the same exact method that we've allowed the biggest advocates for the documents to do. The leak of the century. These are real. You just have to trust me. Those are all phrases that I continually see by the biggest advocates, but they don't want to address anything that I've gone over. Now, I am always apprehensive to speak out against other people and their claims. I always invite them on the show. So for the record, for the last two years, I've reached out to Richard Dolan, and I have a long list of emails to prove it, that I've tried to reach him and say, hey, come and, and prove me wrong, in, in essence, but fun, not, not like a, um, an angry debate. Show me what's going on. And he won't. I do know actually for a fact now that he receives all my requests and ignores them. Way back in the day, I was friends with Richard Olin. I don't know what happened. Nothing happened, but he will not return those messages. Is he mad because I pose an alternate theory? Who knows? I'm not really sure. But as I did with Anthony Bergalia, when I went against his point of view, invited him on so you all found out his point of view. And that was an absolute train wreck. But I tried nonetheless. Jay was the complete opposite. An awesome conversation and one I don't regret. And although I walked out of that with much more respect for Jay um, uh, than going in, meaning I didn't know anything uh, about um, more than like the public articles and stuff, but know about him as a person, that's where I gained so much respect. So even though we walked away, we don't believe e e each other. That's fine. I, I, I want those conversations. But why won't these heavy hitters that, that are calling this the leak of the century and falling back on Greer come on the show? And by the way, I did write Dr. Stephen Greer as well, the pointed questions about the NRO documents. And Dr. Greer's a lot of things, but there's one thing he's not. He's not dumb. And he knows some things about intelligence, intelligence, the intelligence community, government documents, secrecy, classification. He knows that stuff. And I'm shocked that he's trying to pass that NRO document off as real. If he truly believes it's real, um, I asked him five different questions to disprove what I was saying. I haven't heard back yet. If I ever do, I'll be more than happy to do that. But everybody ignores the blatant flaws of this story, makes up the middle to get to a determined conclusion. Everything else they will not tell you about. So in my opinion, it's not about me trying to prove it's a TV script. I mean, heck, I'll throw out another quick one for you. Eric Davis was let go from NIDS. What if he wrote him just to tell Robert Bigelow, hey, look, this is what I can provide you. Give me my, my job back. I'm, I'm connected. Now, it, do I believe that? That's not my going theory, but it's one of them. Absolutely. Because he clearly said that he was let go in April. And months later, he has this groundbreaking, earth-changing, earth-altering, uh, humanity uh, uh, changing revelation within months and it's passed around nids as the story goes what's the intent he didn't work for him anymore maybe it was just simply to get his job back to show hey we can't go public with this but look what i look what i did look who i talked to look at me look at me look at me put me back on payroll is that a possibility just as big as the tv script one so I'm not trying to advocate for a certain theory, but I think what people don't realize is that the burden of proof is not on me, but rather on those that are making the claims. And he said, she said stories and falsified hoax documents, which in my opinion are proven hoaxes, aren't going to cut it anymore. So until they're able to come out and dispute this, this is why I call it the final act. This is why I believe that there really is no hardcore truth behind the Eric Davis notes. Did Thomas Wilson find something, let's say through the Department of Energy and he was denied access because he was with DOD or DIA? Sure, that's a huge stretch, but sure. But that's not what they're saying. 
And so when you look at this from a common sense standpoint, none of it makes sense. And we can't fill the holes and gaps just to draw the lines together. And the evidence is truly lacking. I know in closing, some of you might say, well, you can't accept one possibility like it's a hoax or like it's a TV script or whatever without accepting that it could be true. And I've never said there's 100% no way that this is untrue, but the burden of proof is not on me. And that's what I wanted to punch. And, and I do believe that, yes, anything can be real. But on this, all signs point to no. And from the top down, not only on that NRO document, from the top down of the stories as depicted in the Eric Davis notes, nothing makes sense. And what I saw on Twitter when I brought some, some of this up, and I bring up Twitter just because that seemingly is where people want to respond to me if I tag them, they essentially used a quotation in the notes to further validate the notes. You can't do that. You have to use outside material, common sense, and actual evidence to verify those notes. You can't just call on the notes to prove they're real. That's not how evidence works. And so with that, I thank you all for sitting through what I know is tedious stuff, but it needs to be said. And I put a question mark on whether or not that this is the final act, because I will talk about it again if new evidence is there if richard dolan you guys all write him and say hey greenwald said you don't write him back and he writes me and goes oh you were stuck in my spam which again i know is not true but regardless he's always invited on this show and if he has some evidence to offer you guys i'll bring it to you eric davis calls me tomorrow and says i hate you john but i'll come on and 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 tell the truth he's welcome to anybody is welcome on this show for a respectful conversation. And I truly hope that my conversation with Jay, a conversation between two people who did not agree, that spoke for almost three hours, we never insulted each other, we never raised our voices, we laughed, we had fun, we both learned something about each other and potentially the story, and we ended friends. We need more of that in this field. But until then, we do have to ask these pointed questions. Some are uncomfortable. Some are just important. No matter which way you look at it, we need to ask them nonetheless. This is John Greenwald Jr. signing off, and we'll see you next time.